It's a part of almost everyone's life in the West Country. It joins land together and spans the Great River Tamer. It makes Devon and Cornwall a part of each other and it dominates the skyline with its distinctive appearance. The Tamer Bridge has carried vehicles and commuters for 34 years and is set to take new loads and traffic as it approaches the 21st century. Built between 1959 and 1961, it was England's first suspension bridge this century at a cost of one and a half million pounds. Although the building program is now history, amateur cinematographer Reg Blackett spent many hours on site back in 1959 to 1961, capturing the nostalgic moving images that are to follow, from the laying of the foundation to the official opening by the Queen Mother. Reg's labour of cinematographic love is now available and preserved on film for future generations. Before the construction of the Tamer Road Bridge, the old Saltash Ferry seen here in the 1930s was the only way for passenger and vehicle to cross, other than by the Royal Albert Bridge built by Isambard Kingdom Brunel in 1859. The ferry and the right of crossing goes back into antiquity, tradition holding that the Black Prince was rowed across the passage by local women to join his troops. By the end of the 18th century, the ferry was worked by horseboat and rowed by two men, and it was not until 1832 that the first steam-powered ferry was used after an Act of Parliament was obtained by the Earl of Morley. Before the building of the Tamer Road Bridge, motorists could travel into Cornwall on a roundabout route which took them over par to the great National Park of Dartmoor on a journey that, whilst convincing tourists of the beauty of the moor on a day's outing, added more miles and precious time to the journey of business people and lorry drivers on their trek from Devon to Cornwall. This journey passed through the market town of Tavistock, where Sir Francis Drake was born, later to become Mayor of Plymouth in 1581. Then, on to Gunnys Lake, where the traveller crossed from Devon into Cornwall by way of a 14th century Cornish granite bridge. This was the most southerly link for the crossing. Another main road link from Plymouth into Cornwall was by floating bridge from Devonport to Torpoint via the Torpoint ferries. But by 1950, traffic congestion had grown so acute that the proposed addition of two new larger ferries alone would not have been adequate enough to deal with the ever-increasing traffic problems. So, at a conference in Plymouth in December of 1950, it was decided to press ahead with plans to build a road bridge at Saltash. The authorities promoted a bill in Parliament to authorise the promotion of a toll bridge, and this received royal assent in July of 1957. But two more years were to pass before work was to start, and by then the ever-increasing column of traffic to cross the Tamer by ferry was causing long queues, often with delays of up to an hour. These old steam ferries had been in service for over 30 years, and their carrying capacity was limited and crossing speed very slow. As many vehicles as possible were packed on board, each one being charged a toll whilst crossing. Since 1791, ferry crossings to and from Plymouth and Torpoint have characterised the landscape of the Hamos. At Saltash, the road also crossed the river by ferry with floating bridges even older than those at Tor Point, causing more delays to the growing volume of traffic. So, Plymouth City Council and Cornwall County Council joined forces to plan the much-needed road bridge. For this, they formed a joint committee under the chairmanship of Alderman H.G. Mason. Tenders were invited, and the Cleveland Bridge and Engineering Company of Darlington submitted the lowest tender of £1,346,099, which was accepted in February of 1959. 
These contractors had an international reputation and were famed for their joint work on such projects as the Auckland Harbour Bridge. Alderman Mason felt that the tender which included a projected completion time of 24 months was more than acceptable. And so work started in August of 1959 on the first stages of the main pier foundations which had 30 foot diameters and under the pressure of compressed air was sunk to a depth of 33 feet below the riverbed. This model made by the boys of Penley Secondary Modern School demonstrated by way of an interior view the process of sinking one of these main foundations. The top of the piers were to be granite faced. As work progressed well, the area around the approaches to the bridge soon became stores for tons and tons of materials. A giant concrete mixer was moved in to provide for the upper and lower sites, but not all went according to plan. In February of 1960, it was found necessary to demolish the first 20 feet of stressed concrete on one of the main towers at St Budo. When the shuttering was removed, honeycombing through air bubbles had occurred, and as the work had to pass the most rigid of specifications, the tower had to come down. Round the clock working by eight of the work team soon rectified the problem, and building once again reverted to schedule. On the lower sites, the main towers began to take shape, with the steel framework to hold the concrete in place ready to receive the mix. The main towers would stretch 240 feet above the pier tops and be constructed of reinforced hold concrete to strengthen them for the work ahead. They would be 14 foot square at the bottom and 9 foot at the top, with 2 foot thick walls throughout. With so much engineering work and heavy plant, casualties on the construction site were rare, although, tragically, a number of bridge workmen drowned when their motorboat sank. Despite the launching of many small craft and an intensified rescue attempt, the Western Morning News reported that the 14-foot motorboat was about one-third of the way across from Salt Ash and close to the Albert Bridge when it sank in a swell. At the time, a stiff southwesterly wind was blowing, five workmen lost their lives, although thankfully ten were rescued through the diligence of rescue teams and colleagues. A year or so later, a steel erector fell a hundred feet from the bridge to his death, his workmates staying away from the site for two days as a mark of respect for their colleague. These events were major setbacks for the joint project, but work eventually continued, although in the shadow of tragedy. On the Cornish side, the Salt Ashborough Council helped in the prompt provision of land clearance for the construction purposes, but there was a social cost, for the Zetland Masonic Cemetery in the 4th Street area of Salt Ash had to be acquired, and according to a public notice in the local press, the remains of all deceased persons interred therein were to be moved to another burial ground or cemetery, the price of progress thus reaching even into the grave. Because the main towers were 240 feet high, the workmen accessed them by way of a lift fixed to the crane work at the top of which the cable frames were undergoing completion. Reg Blackett was given freedom at the top of the towers to obtain these unique and memorable images of an engineering masterpiece under construction. Blasting into the land rock was then necessary to produce the anchorage tunnels. Some 55 foot long and at an incline of 35 degrees, these tunnels tapered from 12 foot at entry to 20 foot under the base with 3.5 inch high tensile steel pre-stress anchorage rods extending the full depth of the tunnel and arranged in pairs to anchor the cable strands. 
Vandalism became a serious problem for the security teams, although more prevalent after the opening of the bridge in 1961. Residents living below the structure in 4th Street, Saltash, reported that windows had been smashed and things thrown from the bridge, including a hammer that had knocked the bottom out of a boat. Even sections of steelworks, planks and other tools had been thrown into the river. At weekends, the walls of the toilets were daubed with red lead paint and general damage occurred, according to the bridge manager. Shouting and fighting also became a regular event, especially at night. One case of vandalism had nearly killed an 11-year-old boy, reported one of the Saltash residents. As a result of a damaged door to one of the towers, the boy fell through and was only saved from falling 120 feet by three planks which had been placed there by workmen. One of the bridge inspectors at the time, who was part of a new 24-hour watch team, said it was necessary to take these things as a matter of degree. Where there was such a vast construction project, vandalism was inevitable. Named after the D-Day landings, Normandy Way at St Budo was to become part of the main approach to the bridge on the Devonport side after clearing away hundreds of thousands of tonnes of topsoil ready for the laying of the road foundation. This work was undertaken by the Plymouth City Works Department. As work progressed at a good pace, the anchorages were completed when the core strands were delivered to the site. Each 2,200 foot long supporting strand weighing 13.5 tonnes had a pre-tested working load of 110 tonnes and a breaking strain of 324 tonnes. walk made of wire meshing was constructed across from tower to tower and was necessary to take the steel strands and would be used by the workmen to pull the cables across and later to fix the clamps for the suspended coil ropes. These in turn would take the steel framework, each strand taking 20 minutes to cross the catwalk. With a highly motivated workforce, labour problems were rare. But when 50 steel erectors were dismissed on the spot for taking part in an unofficial strike, relationships degenerated and scuffles and abuse resulted, according to a report in the Western Morning News dated the 8th of April 1961. The labour dispute created a delay of two weeks and appeared to mar an otherwise healthy labour management relationship over the period of the construction. As the bridge's completion drew ever closer, objections to the three shillings toll for private motor vehicles were raised. At a public inquiry at the Plymouth Guildhall in December of 1960, 12 organisations and individuals had given notice that they would object to the schedule of tolls as proposed by the Tamer Bridge and Torpoint Ferry Tolls Order of 1960. The Joint Committee responded by pointing out that since no government grants had been forthcoming, the entire undertaking had to be self-financing. Wednesday, January the 11th, 1961. An historic day for the Torpoint Ferry, with the introduction of the new diesel-electric ferries built by Messrs John Thornycroft and Company Limited. These new ferries would be faster and able to carry more vehicles and were introduced as a prelude to the opening of the Tamer Road Bridge just a few months later. These floating bridges heralded the beginning of the passing of the steam age in the ferry service on the rivers and the waters of Plymouth. Once the bridge had fully opened, further controversy about the tolling charges persisted, 
A tiny Cornish town asked for help from the Plymouth City Fire Brigade in tender, but like all other transport, had to pay the correct toll to cross the bridge. Officials of the Plymouth City Treasury, which collected the tolls, had decided that all vehicles must pay without exception. The Treasury reported that government departments were their only awkward customers, and whilst they charged fire, police and ambulance drivers, there would never be a hold-up in emergencies. Appliances would go straight through and be billed later. As the steel framework took shape on the pontoons at Saltash Passage, the two main cables made up of 31 coil strands were completed with the hoisting across of the last 2,200 foot coil strand by winch. Each strand was fully galvanised and socketed to fix to the anchorage rods and anchorages. The suspenders were made from single strand, a two and a half inch diameter locked coil rope and hung from steel clasps from the main cable. The first big steel framework that would take the roadway was ready to be floated out into midstream for loading into position. Two seven-ton winches using the block and tackle principle were to be lifted into place. After days of testing, during which the hoisting gear was placed under full stress, all was ready and the 80-ton centre section of the bridge was hoisted smoothly into position as a cold drizzle fell. The hoist taking only 30 minutes to complete. Further sections either side were now to be lifted every four or five days and during the erection of each steel framework the tips of the towers would move and bend due to the uneven loading on the main cables as they dropped ten feet. But as more framework was added everything would fit into its proper position. The framework had to withstand the most inclement of weather during the bridge's life and in December of 1961, the strength of the bridge was fully tested. Hurricane force winds roaring through the steel framework had helped to prove that the blueprints had been transferred to steel and concrete with complete success. No matter how advanced or accurate modern scientific aids were in the bridge building, every suspension bridge had its individual character, and the acid test of its success was to be actual working conditions. There had been no surprises at all since the opening of the bridge and it had behaved exactly as it was expected to. The consulting engineers felt that their prodigy was snug, safe and eminently satisfactory. As the road approaches on the St. Budo side were taking shape and the new roundabout and administration offices were nearing completion, work on the individual bridge entrances was well underway, the laying of reinforced steel ready for the concreting of the road levels. The steel framework fixings also made steady progress toward the main towers and the construction had to be planned this way to equal the loading on the cables of the main spans. On site, more sections of the main span were being prepared, each girder bolted together with the aid of a power spanner and sealed. Work on the steel section of the roadway was at halfway stage, as the steel framework was floated out ready for hoisting the hundred feet from the pontoon to be placed beside other sections. These lifts had to take place during slack water, as there was limited time available before the currents became too strong. The roadway had to accommodate well over 4,500 vehicles a day, but experts had greatly underestimated the usage before construction by some 
Before completion, tolls were fixed on the basis of a daily average of some 4,500 vehicles, but by the end of the first year of use, the averages had risen to over 6,750 per day, and this was steadily increasing. On Friday the 7th of August 1992, 23,746 vehicles crossed the bridge in that day. The difficult operation of joining the steel road decks together high above the river was due to the lack of play in the high tensile steel bolts when driven into the bolt holes. There could be no toleration of movement. Each girder had 16 bolts to be driven home and locked by a high-powered spanner and thus sealed permanently. During the erection, there would be a movement upwards and outwards of the main towers of 5 inches due to unequal loading. A 50-ton hydraulic jack system was set in a steel beam at the top of each tower to push them back into the upright position after each loading was placed on the cable. Although the roadway would move up, down and sideways according to the load and temperature, when the bridge finally came into use, this movement would not be noticeable to users. And with the last big piece of steelwork bolted into place, the gap between the main tower and span would be closed when the individual girders were fixed. After this, only two small gaps would remain in the span between the legs and the pillars. These would shrink as more weight was added to the main span. As each load of concrete was tipped onto the road level, the hump dropped a little more and the gap narrowed. When the loading was complete, the gaps would close together. The work of concreting the deck was affected by the building of 30-foot slabs with 7-inch thick reinforced concrete, each taking about five hours to produce. The finished bridge would weigh 49,200 tonnes with a suspended weight of 8,000 tonnes. Its overall length would be 1,848 feet and width 50 feet. Surface concrete was to be laid to a depth of 6 inches with asphalt 1.5 inches thick. At high water the clearance would be 110 feet and there would be a safety sway of 3 inches in a 100 mile per hour wind. A speed limit of 30 mile per hour was to be introduced and vehicles over 75 tonne in weight would be required to seek permission. The toll booths were also completed and were necessary to defray the cost of the bridge building since the government had refused any financial help in the venture. The Lord Mayor of Plymouth, Alderman Arthur Goldberg, joined by the Tamer Bridge Joint Committee's Chairman, Sir John Carew Pole and Sir Clifford Tozer, visited the site to see the results of their efforts and walked over the total suspended length of 1,848 feet the longest single span of any bridge in England at the time. Much work was still to be done, including the fixing of the watertight wrappings which was underway when the party arrived. They were also interested in the expansion plates and in charge of the party, Mr J. Kenneth Anderson, the consulting engineer. The 24th of October 1961 a great day in the history of the West Country, as this day marked the opening of the one and a half million pound Tamer Road Bridge. Some drivers spent all night in their cars so that they could be the first to cross, despite the lashing wind and rain, but there was no ceremony at this time. This had been deferred until April of 1962. 
17 hours after the opening at 6 a.m. in that morning, 5,066 motor vehicles, including motorcycles, had crossed the bridge. But the euphoria surrounding the opening of the bridge was tinged with sadness at the passing of the old Saltash Ferry. It was time to say farewell. Officially, the last ferry left Plymouth shore at 11.15 p.m. on Monday, October the 23rd, accompanied by the sound of motor horns and the singing of Old Lang Syne. On reaching Salt Ash, three rousing cheers were given to mark the end of over 600 years of ferry service, dating back to the days when the Black Prince was rowed across the water by locals. These old steam ferries had been in service since 1928, and had given excellent service to the community. The sound of ferry chains was to be no more. Many of Saltash's residents turned out to see the civic farewell to the ferry service. The Mayor of Saltash, Mr Mars Huggins, and members of the council went in procession behind the police and mace bearers through the town to the ferry which was dressed for the occasion. It was time to cross the Tamer for a final trip and back again. Many tried to rush the ferry as it started, but were ordered off. And then the last journey began in the shadow of the mighty Tamer Bridge, which would now take its place. Indeed, the death of a long-established ferry service had taken place that day. Alongside Brunel's rail bridge stood the new Tamer Road Bridge, a gateway to Cornwall as some now called it, complete and ready for the official opening. On April the 26th, 1962, the flags of Plymouth and Cornwall flew as crowds gathered. The Territorial Guard of Honour waited to greet Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth, the Queen Mother.
All traffic was stopped on this occasion for the first time since the opening in October of 1961. It would be another 33 years before a complete ban on vehicles would again be in effect. But this day in April of 1962 belonged to the people of the West Country. Two and a half years of intensive building and construction dissolved into history as the Queen Mother declared the bridge well and truly open. The joint project had finally resulted in a successful bridging of the River Tamer. Saturday the 23rd of September 1995 and 33 years after its official opening by the Queen Mother the Tamer Bridge was closed entirely to traffic from midnight. On the Monday following a reporter of the Plymouth Evening Herald Katie Tokas reported the Tamer Bridge linking Plymouth and Salt Ash closed to traffic for the first time in its 34 year history at the weekend but the mammoth project enabling complete structural tasks went like clockwork. For six hours from midnight on Saturday to 6 a.m. on Sunday, the bridge was empty of cars, although pedestrians were allowed to walk across. The only other vehicles on the bridge were two 16-ton lorries, which were needed for testing the stresses and strains on the structure. New European Union regulations governing the weight of lorries meant that engineers needed to close the bridge to carry out load-bearing tests. Traffic was diverted to the A30 from as far as Exeter in the east and the far west of Cornwall. Three Torpoint ferries ran free throughout the period of the closure as a concession to drivers from the Torpoint Ferry and Tamer Bridge Committee. The emergency services were allowed to cross if it was necessary and a British gas alert van was posted on the Cornwall side of the bridge in case of call-outs. Bridge manager Roger Warren said that the results of the tests carried out by the saltash based Southwest surveys would not be available for some weeks as they needed careful analysis. But he added, there are no plans for further closures. The bridge has not been deliberately closed to traffic since it opened to the public in 1962 when it was opened by the Queen Mother officially. As the two heavy lorries trundled into the bridge, it seemed to ripple and shook noticeably. Through the railings, it seemed that the land was moving up and down. At Tor Point, all three ferries were in action, although very little traffic appeared to be crossing. So, 
the Tamer Bridge approaches the 21st century, a monument in time and a testimony to all who were involved in this unique joint project.